shopping on the weekends. Shopping. Yeah. Oh, after a bigger match?
meetings. Uh, today's meeting is there for consensus. It's not for decision. So uh, everything you bring before us will be uh, well thought out, discussed, and hopefully consensed by the time it's completed. Uh, so we'll get underway here and be on time. So Association of Bilingual Municipalities. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Stewart and, and members of council. And I gather Deputy Mayor Hendricks is chairing. So yes. thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, be here to be able to present some information about the uh, Alberta Bilingual Municipal Association or l'Association Bilingue des Municipalités de l'Alberta. I have with me Martin Blanchet, who is the Communications Director with the Conseil de Développement Economique um, as well. Um, so it's great to have the opportunity. and. Uh, We'd like to offer our thanks to the former CEO and the Economic Development Officer uh, for your uh, your support of the uh, what used to be called Concerto and now the Alberta Bilingual Municipal Association. So I understand that our staff did share uh, the, pr the presentation that you have before us. So we'll go through some of the some of the slides so for your information. Um, so basically, the uh, the organization of Alberta Bilingual Municipal Association uh, was launched in 2010, November 2010. And it was developed and inspired by uh, a model that's in Manitoba. Um, so it aims to create collaboration and draws on the rich history of Francophone pioneers and French as first European language spoken in Alberta. So we have some statistics. There's over the last census of 2016, 88,000 Albertans are Francophone, 268,640 speak French. So that's a 34% increase since 1996. And Alberta has the fastest growing Francophone population in Canada. Um, so the network of municipalities is to share best practices and leveraging the presence of the Francophone uh, in their communities. And we see it as a complementary to the municipal branding that any community has. That, that's a part of our, this organization. And it's also an inclusive model where different stakeholders come together around one common objective, um, that being of economic development. And as a former elected official, resident in Beaumont, I know uh, that there's been lots of discussions about economic development. And I also know that you have a new economic development officer. Um, so it's, uh, I thought it was appropriate that we should um, spend a little bit of time to be able to talk about uh, about this, the work of this organization. Um, so its vision and mission, um, it's to unite municipalities that have, that have or are interested in promoting their economic prosperity through bilingualism. And of course, it's the official languages of the association, so French and English. Foster collaboration among member municipalities around common goals for economic growth in their respective region. And bilingual is used here to describe those municipalities that acknowledge the Francophone presence in their community. So we know that not everyone in all these communities are Francophone, but they have a strong population or a percentage of the population that, that does um, see the, uh, seek the, the economic and social benefits associated with that presence. So the stakeholders, of course, are uh, the Conseil de Développement Économique in the middle of the circle is the organization that led the initiative to, uh, to get this organization uh, going. Um, so the stakeholders are its municipal elected officials, senior municipal economic development officials, a champion designated by city or municipal council, um, a champion designated by the community, so that's the mostly in a lot of communities, the French Association, Association Canadienne Francaise de la Liberté, and that's what that stands for. Uh, local organization representatives, the Conseil de Développement Économique, and if you, some of you may recall that Beaumont signed uh, uh, an agreement to be part of Concerto back in September of 2013. So this is going to be five years that this uh, that Beaumont has participated, and over the course of uh, the years, there are several communities: uh, Galmore and Dill St. Albert, St. Paul, Bonneville, Smoky River, Falaire. Uh, Donnelly and last month uh, the city of Grand Prairie are part of, uh, of this group and at the, our last February board meeting uh, after the elections the organization didn't meet till reorganization and everybody had a sense to line up where their uh, where the councils were going budgets etc so our first board meeting um, was uh, to elect a new executive in February and um, 10 of the 11 members participated, and Beaumont's absence uh, 
was uh, was noted. Bird did uh, was able to participate via telephone, but not uh, not in person. Um, so we have uh, the chair is uh, Councillor Natalie Jolly from St. Albert. Uh, the vice chair is Elisa Brasso from Bonneville. Uh, the secretary is Colette Bergen from Lacobiche Pomonded area, and uh, the treasurer is Trina Jones from Legal, and the, with the director to have a composition of five is Ron Boivere from St. Paul. So there's uh, a good cross section of representation from across the province. The next that map is kind of hard to read, but I just wanted to highlight, because uh, we often have discussions as to how many people speak French, how many Francophones may they, they might be in, a, in uh, Beaumont, and the population of 2016 was 17,000, just under 17,400. Um, at that point, French as a language, uh, the mother tongue was 504. People that do understand and are able to speak French is 2,520. So that's a percentage of people who understand French of 14.52 percent. Um, so, and I'm not sure if it's a combination of those that have French as a mother tongue and those that understand French. So, we estimate about 20 percent of, of the population in Beaumont that is of Francophone origin or able to speak French. <coughs> So, um, according to the 2016 census, uh, over 418,000 or 11% of the Albertans are, are French or French Canadian descendants. Alberta ranked five in, fifth in bilingual population size, so we identified 268,000 uh, in uh, were bilingual in 2016. Uh, com or uh, sorry, 238,000. Try that again. 268. In 2016, 238 in 2011. So that's a 12 and a half percent increase. 28 percent of kindergarten to grade 12 students were enrolled in French immersion, or French as a second language. So that's um, in uh, in 2016, 2017. Besides that, there are 31 communities in Alberta that have a francophone presence. So that can be schools, parishes, community centers, community groups, and volunteers. So that gives you. Uh, an idea of the, uh, the the possibility of connecting with people in in the, in that work that line of work. So the four pillars that uh, were identified by Concerto at the time that it was formed and still remain today. Um, so they've got economic immigration and development, investor attraction tourism development and green energy initiatives. So there are, those are the four pillars that have been identified and uh, we're going to be, the organization will be working with the communities, gathering their uh, municipal plans and trying to identify what the priorities, what they see the priorities within those, those four pillars and where uh, support can be provided to the communities. So the benefits for the members, the membership to this to date is free. Um, the our association was incorporated from Concerto, uh, was incorporated officially in October of last year, and the intention there was there there's possibilities of getting funding, grants, uh, dollars to assist the organizations, the communities that the Conseil de Développement Économique may not be able to get. So that was the purpose of the the incorporation. The administration coordination is currently provided by the Conseil de Développement Économique. Um, and some of the projects uh, that have been completed are in our, uh, or are in progress. Um, a study to review inventory of green ga greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, some of our communities participated in that. There was $54,000 that was allocated to that. The municipality took advantage of its connection with the association to conduct a waste management analysis. So that's in the St. Paul, the St. Paul region. That's $500,000 there. There's a lot of discussions about hemp. In, in the region, and so there were some dollars that were allocated for that. Um, some communities took advantage of CN as a program to improve parks in their communities, specifically where there are railroads. So there's some dollars that were allocated for that. And uh, Beaumont and um, another community also participated in community capacity building program, an assessment tool that was offered to the communities. And um, some of there's additional possible projects funding that might be available through federal and or provincial partners. 
So some of the benefits that are seen for our members is the increase in competitiveness of the municipality compared to unilingual municipalities. So we see it as a definite benefit advantage. Uh, increases the region's attractiveness to investment by demonstrating the openness to collaborative ventures, greater access to francophone entrepreneurs. So I know we have lots of real estate that's empty, so there may be opportunity to attract businesses in those in those uh, buildings. Uh, it also increases the region's scope of influence at the provincial and federal level, and helps encourage business startups because with the concept of development economic, they also have an arm that works with new. Uh, new business uh, startups and so they have a, a group that works with them from there. Um, it supports the creation of consolidation of community projects um, and increases the economic growth in our region and uh, several of our members including Beaumont are also a member of the Association of Francophone and Francophile Municipalities so that's uh, an international uh, network of Francophone Francophile communities and um, so those are some of the events uh, that are taking place there. Some of the next steps uh, we identified that there will be four meetings uh, per year two in person two in uh, via conference telephone conference uh, the next meeting in person is most likely going to be in Grand Prairie and it should be in September not October um, then we are working together with the association and the Conseil de Development Economique because the provincial government has looked at uh, establishing a French policy uh, for the for the province and uh, so we want to have some some input some in the, the ability to provide some input into that um, at April's the April 17 board meeting uh, Beaumont was unfortunately not present but I think we had someone um, call in. Uh, so there were updates from the communities. Uh, there was also commitment from all the members uh, to gather information regarding the action plans and the expectations from the association. And uh, there is also an initiative to gather uh, community demographics uh, that we just presented earlier. And uh, with that, if uh, there's any questions, I had another note somewhere, something I missed. Um, here I am, sorry. So some of the, uh, I guess, in the next steps, we'd like, we'd like to ask this council to formally appoint a council representative to this organization uh, to participate in uh, the association's uh, activities and also confirmation who from the administration would be the contact uh, with our staff. Um, number two is provide a copy of the strategic and business plans to identify the needs to our administration. And number three, uh, there is funding that will be, uh, that's been obtained uh, from the province, I believe it's the province or the federal government, uh, that the members of the association can attend, plan and attend the AGM and the board meeting in Grand Prairie September 5th, 6th and 7th. So hopefully we can see a Beaumont representative from that and Grand Prairie will be hosting the Association of Francophone and Francophile uh, international event taking place there. So with that, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Great, and, and thank you. Uh, let's go to the amendment first, just to see if there's anything further to add before we go to questions. Thank you. Nothing? Nothing. Okay, thank you. Councillors, uh, start with the mayor. Any questions, comments? Um, just two seconds, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I apologize for, for missing those two meetings. For some reason, they, they weren't on our radar, and we had not known, I had not known about them. So we will, of course, economic development being one of our high priorities, uh, rectify the problem and, and fix it. So I don't think it's too unreasonable to ask that we appoint a counselor at the next meeting, at our next opportunity, and sort the staff out and, and, and get back on track. Those are my two, that's my two cents. But thank you very much for coming in today. Thank you. Uh, I was going to ask if, we, yeah, I thought we were still members and we should be participating. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Councillors. Steve. Uh, one question I had for you in this is the, the project's completed and in progress. So um, what, explain to me the connection, or do you know the connection? So uh, the projects that were completed uh, would they not have been completed if there would not if there was not a partnership of it uh, through through the association is that is that the point of that I, I'm under I, I'm 
struggling to figure out the point of that, I guess. Yeah. Like so the concerted organization was the, the start from the Conseil de Développement Economique. So that was what was launched in 2010. And then eventually the membership uh, took place from there. And through uh, their staff, the Conseil de Développement Economique, the, the staff, they've been able to get funding through the, the various community initiatives through the concerted group and not necessarily through the Conseil de Development Economic. So they're two, while they were part of the same entity at one point, they're still supported by the staff of the Conseil de Development Economic, but the Bilingual Association is expecting in, at some point to become a, its own separate entity. That's why the incorporation took place. <clears throat> and then the projects from there were at the request of the communities themselves. Um, so I know the area in the Bonneville, um, St. Paul area needs certain services. Northern Alberta has some other services, so that's where, and for St. Albert, Morinville, Legale, uh, Beaumont, and an area is more the economic development, tourism, tourism attraction, trying to make our communities a destination of choice uh, so that people will come out to, to the various communities. So those were various initiatives that depending on where and for where the priority so the 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 communities might be. Mm -hmm. And so had they not been members uh, or part of it, they wouldn't have realized the potential of gaining those funds for those projects? That's what I understand. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And it's kind of odd because I was sitting on the other side of the table and I was the chair of the organization, but I was not involved in the, the day today. So here, I am here today because the board of that organization, that association after the election is brand new. And um, so the continuity, the history, etc. cetera. Um, and there's also been some changes with, with the staff at the Conseil de Développement Academic. So that's why they've asked me if I would work with them to get this organization up because I'm not a member of the board. Mm -hmm. I'm simply helping to move this process forward. Yeah. Thanks, Lynn. Great. So. Yeah, firstly, welcome back to Council Chambers. It must be a bit weird sitting on that side. Um, but, uh, Indeed. Yeah, no, welcome back. Um, you, you spoke a little bit about the benefits for its members um, in a very general sense. It indicated that we've been, we as a bond, want to be part of this since 2013. C could you give some specific um, examples of where, how you think it's benefited Beaumont specifically um, to, to, to be a part of this organization? Well, I think, number one, the exposure with the organization, the exposure as a, a bilingual community to be part of the network, so be able to promote the fact that we are. We have francophone roots, francophone history, culture, so that certainly was very worthwhile in, in that. We've also participated in that international uh, francophone, francophile network. Um, that is exposure internationally. Um, I'm not sure economic benefit that we may have received, but you know they've got their website, they've got their links, they've got the events, and it's exposure um, nationally, especially, but internationally as well. Um, the dollars that we got for the one initiative that we worked on, um, looking at some economic initiatives, um, we went through the exercise, but nothing seemed to have transpired uh, transpired from there so those are some quick ones that I can uh, that I can think of okay any further questions uh, hearing none <laughs> sorry, sorry go ahead. Just make, Mike make a comment uh, Councillor Hendricks um, so what administration will do is bring back uh, a report to regular council right. where we can discuss membership and appoint a council great excellent thank you okay Thank and you. if there are any questions, uh, we have the staff at the Conseil de Development Academic, and you know, you know how to reach me as uh, as well. Okay. All right. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Good night. Oh yes, please. Thanks. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Next item up: our uh, zoning blueprint, land use file update. Joanne Dargis and McAuley. Is that fair? Chair, before we get, I got a question. Before we get into the presentation, no, that's okay. okay. I'm not gonna. I'm, uh, I can go straight back. I'm just gonna do a quick introduction. Um, so, presented to you um, with the agenda was um, the draft form of the zoning blueprint. So, um, the format of what we propose to move forward with um, for the land use, the new rewrite of the land use bylaw. Um, we have the consultant representatives here today from Mechelaney, so that's Stephanie Daniel, 
and Melissa Ayers, um, who will be doing a presentation. I don't want to take up any more of their time from the presentation and then opportunities for questions, but I wanted to just give that introduction <coughs> for you. And as they um, move through um, the presentation, there'll be opportunity for questions afterwards. Great. So before we start, if I can, uh, Councillor Sam. Yeah, I, we can go through this just before we get to the next item. I just had a modification to the agenda that I don't know if we had a chance to, to speak to. Sorry. Um, okay. We can do that then we'll move forward. Thanks. Please. Thank you very much for uh, having us here tonight. Get to talk about the ladies' Bella. Um, <coughs> I'm sorry. Oh, was the present? We get to put the presentation. Yeah. Um, there Fantastic. Okay. Just want to make sure all the background information is up. <clears throat> so thank you again for letting us come and talk to you about the approach for the land use bylaw tonight. Um, wanted to just give you there we go the overview of where we're at for the project. Um, it is intended to have uh, bylaw basically approved through the public hearing process by the end of 2018. We're currently in the kind of background research stage, um, a lot of engagement, public engagement, discussions with council stakeholders, that sort of thing. Um, we did start out with some uh, research around the area around density and different zoning approaches, which is what we're here today to talk about. We've also um, submitted the um, background report to uh, administration and council for uh, consideration in the project, and all of that information will inform us as we actually start writing the bylaw. Pretty much next month so it's a pretty quick project but um, tonight we need to understand a little bit more um, about the approach that is desirable for the bylaw we've made some recommendations we just want to explain where those recommendations are coming from and why we're <coughs> proposing them and get some feedback from you guys um, to see how you want to move forward uh, so the purpose tonight of course to confirm the approach for our zoning blueprint and the new land use bylaw for Beaumont. Um, here we go. The goals for the project, we had three broad goals. Um, and one is that the, the new bylaw needs to be easy to use and understand uh, for everybody. You know, every applicant that comes in, administration that uses it, council that sees the applications, needs to be very clear and understandable. We want to have certainty in the decision making and the process for any applications that come forward. And we want to have some flexibility on the design, particularly on a site level and a neighborhood level. So those are our broad goals that are informing the approach that we're recommending today. There are two um, components to consider uh, in terms of the approach for zoning. One is use and one is form. We've talked a little bit about these. You could have a primarily use-based bylaw or primarily form-based bylaw. Um, however, just about every bylaw has elements of both. Um, most of the land use bylaws in Alberta are primarily use-based because the MGA requires uses to be defined in every land use bylaw. The form-based elements are actually optional elements according to the Municipal Government Act. But those are things that you see in every bylaw as well. Height, setbacks, coverage. Um, we, those are pretty much considered standard items. So every bylaw in itself are a mix of use and form. What we're trying to get a better understanding of, of is what that mix for Beaumont should be. So use is about the activity on a parcel. Um, commercial, residential, institutional, utility, what is actually happening on the parcel, in the building, on the site, whatever that is, it's the activity that's occurring. The form is about the building and the site, what it, it looks like, how it feels, um, how it, uh, how you relate, relate to it as you walk down the street. That's what we mean by, by form. How big is the building? Where is it located compared to the sidewalks in the street? Where is the parking located? Where are the trees located? How many are they? How big are they? Those are kind of those form elements. How many windows do you have? Where is the doorway? Um, how, does, how do people actually go in and out of the building? Um, what does it mean when you're walking down the main street and you have displays with your windows? And um, How is the, the articulation of the building defined? Um, that being said, most bylaws, when you're talking about form, don't get into things like materials, building materials, and very specific architectural elements. These are, are broad design aspects. I also just want to mention density, uh, mostly because 
density is easily um, confused with form. When we talk about form, sometimes we end up talking about density. And they are two different things. So, uh, we, for example, when we talk about residential development, you talk about du duplex. So you have an idea that pops in your mind about what the form of that is. But a duplex, in essence, means two units, two residential units. Uh, so we're not specifically talking about density here. It's just about use and form. So I just wanted to identify that as a, a different characteristic. Density can come in a lot of different forms. Uh, and density will be included in the bylaw, but it's not about the approach here. So as I mentioned, every type of bylaw has both use and form elements. Um, and in Alberta, they've been historically primarily use-based because of how the MGA is structured. And those MGA requirements are still mandatory requirements, and we will, of course, meet all of those requirements that the MGA requires. But the optional ones, there is an opportunity to increase the, the types of design elements that the optional um, items in the MGA allow for. So right now we talk about height, setbacks, things like that. The MGA also allows for uh, consideration of the design and appearance of buildings, subdivision standards. Uh, there's a lot more opportunity in the MGA than what is currently considered standard practice in most land use bylaws. And it's those elements that we are proposing to introduce um, here in this bylaw. So when you have a use-based bylaw, uh, it typically relates to cr the creation of a building envelope on a site where you have the overall maximum that a building could potentially become. It's defined by density, the setbacks, where the parking goes, uh, the maximum building height that you get that overall framework. What goes in it is the use, but how that building envelope should actually be used, what articulation, what relationship that building envelope has to adjacent parcels or to the street or how you experience it is not defined in a use-based bylaw. When you add some design elements, you get some definition of that building envelope, but often not quite enough. And design guidelines themselves are um, typically based on negotiation and they're challenging to enforce. They also don't necessarily provide a lot of certainty at the beginning for anybody using them because you're not quite sure which design elements are gonna actually inform the outcome. Uh, it's very process heavy in terms of how you get to what is actually built from what is applied to. Or when you add design in a regulatory format into the bylaw, you get a lot more certainty into the form that you create. Uh, there are different design elements that are added into the bylaw that become rules instead of recommendations. Uh, they are standard design features, not optional ones typically, where the discretion is determined already. We already know in certain circumstances which design elements are really important. And those ones, instead of being an option that could be included, they become the standard. And so those sometimes are uh, how, particularly how the building relates to the street, they call them site frontage requirements, you know, how wide the building can be, how deep the building can be. It goes into a level of detail even sometimes of um, how many, uh, how high different stories can be, um, how deep the building, these are all options that could be included. The amount of transparency that needs to be on certain sides of the building um, beyond what the building code already, already states in order to achieve the outcome that is desirable for certain areas. It also typically goes into a level of detail of um, uses based on the, the floor or the story. So instead of just defining a broad use for a general area, it will actually define uses that are appropriate for certain stories of a building. Um, so if it's ground floor retail and residential above, that can be defined in more certainty, in more detail um, than what uh, just a single use district would be. Hmm. This is an example of what a form-based code looks like or form-based zoning bylaw. They're very uh, graphics heavy where you have uh, a lot of visualizations of the different sites, options for the buildings that then provide on one page you can very clearly understand exactly what, you're ha what is going on in a site, what the rules are. There's minimums and maximums, a lot of ranges 
um, for what you can do in terms of width or depth. Um, so there is flexibility in that regard. Um, but it's all right there on one page. That's pretty much this, in this particular example, um, this is this district. There's only one additional page that has a little bit more information specifically on parking and encroachments. Other than that, all of the rules are right there. Um, they're easy to understand. There, there is also a, a general graphic um, that goes into more detail as well of what this, this is. So this is kind of what we're proposing is a hybrid approach where you can see that the form elements are there, the use elements are still there, um, so you get the mix of both, but it includes the design standards in a regulatory format as opposed to as guidelines. The key differences between traditional or use-based zoning and form-based zoning, there's, there's quite a few. Um, the obvious one is use-based zoning is based on uses, whereas form-based zoning de-emphasizes use in that the form becomes the primary element that you're regulating. Use is still important and important to define, uh, but it's not the first thing that people see when they look at what uh, the outcome is for a certain district. In traditional zoning, uh, this, the uses that are defined are based on very broad districts. Uh, in form-based zoning, they tend to relate, they're defined by streets. Uh, so the maps look a little bit different because the, the districts are defined by the street location as opposed to the broad uh, you know, neighborhood areas. And that's because a lot of the form is in relationship to how it, uh, to what's occurring on the street. So there's a more integrated approach in that regard. Um, traditional zoning is usually about separating uses. Uh, Form-based zoning, you mix them because you start talking about what happens on each floor as opposed to just general broad areas. Um, the outcome is that you get a lot more diversity in the neighborhoods. Again, you focus on the building and site uh, with enforceable regulations as opposed to guidelines. Uh, very much attention to the streetscape um, and the transition between parcels where use-based zoning has very little information on the public realm and what occurs outside of that building envelope. For based zoning is very concise and organized and easy to understand, very much based on the visualization of the site. Um, a lot of use-based uh, bylaws don't have any graphics or illustrations at all. They have been added over time, um, but they're not quite as clear as in a form-based situation. Uh, the biggest challenge with form-based zoning is um, our need to learn about the implementation of it. It is a relatively new tool in Alberta and in Canada, and it has not been implemented in many places. So the one uh, example in Alberta is in High River, where they do have a form-based code that is adopted, and they have a monitoring program as well. And uh, that monitoring program has only been in place for six months, since October 2017. Um, they, uh, they are intending to release the results of the monitoring as well. They have a very similar bylaw to this. Um, they actually have six districts in their land use bylaw, all mixed use and all based on those uh, relationship to the public realm and the form. But they also include all the use base and meet all the requirements of the Municipal Government Act. For High River, um, we have some information on how that implementation has occurred and they have, um, the, the one biggest challenge that they've had is they, they focus their economic development activities specifically on the vision that the town had. So the land use bylaw played into that, uh, but it wasn't the driving factor. Um, their municipal development plan also defined what they wanted to be in terms of what sorts of businesses they wanted to attract and how they wanted to grow as a municipality. And so Land Use Bylaw supported that. And so they did some very targeted um, economic development initiatives as a result. And they actually have had quite a bit of success with that. They've had some headquarters um, announce that they are moving there in the last uh, couple of weeks an announcement has come out. And so they've grown their economic development as a result of a more holistic approach to how they wanted to, to do business. Um, the development community has been very supportive of a form-based approach. Um, by reducing the number of districts, becoming much more clear in terms of what that form is that you're looking for, but uh, still providing flexibility. Their process requirements in terms of how to um, implement a new neighborhood design 
has been reduced. They're not looking at um, several zones, they're looking at a few zones to do the same type of development that they would do anyways. Um, does it reduce their permissions or the level of detail that they put into their, their plans? Um, but in terms of the implementation piece, it has made it easier for them to implement. Uh, there was some, um, in High River in particular, they had a unique situation where they decided to um, require rear lanes in all new residential development. That was unique to High River. Uh, still, you know, an option, but there was some concern from the development community uh, on that particular standard, as opposed to the, the approach overall. That was mostly due to um, most new housing product, or a good portion of it, is front car garages, and High River decided to deliberately go away from that. They had policy direction for it in their municipal development plan, and they chose to implement it in their land use bylaw, so that was the question that was, was raised. Um, but once the developers understood it, um, they also have been quite supportive in, in the last few months in implementing changes to their um, outline plans and neighborhood plans. Um, those are kind of the two big learnings that they have right now. There will be more information that is forthcoming as the land use bylaw becomes implemented in more detail there, but having only been tracked for six months, that's the information we have right now. So, um, those are kind of the big ones. So for Beaumont, we're proposing a hybrid approach between a use-based and a form-based code. In any land use bylaw, there's three general sections to it. There's the land use section, which is required under the Municipal Government Act. There's the administrative section, also a mandatory requirement that defines the process for development permit applications, who gets notified, um, how that process occurs, um, how long it takes to make decisions, who is making decisions, that's a mandatory requirement. And then there's development standards that um, are basically a necessity. Um, so what we're proposing is a mix of both, and you can see how we're, we're proposing that it um, is combined. On the land use, obviously it's defined by use under the MGA, so there's a significant aspect of the use-based approach that we would be proposing for the land use districts themselves with the form-based element mixed in. Um, the administration side with form considerations, which are really design considerations, there is um, the option for, or the question of how the process for review of design occurs, and this is where permitted versus discretionary uses come into play a little bit more. Um, where there's a permitted use, the design elements uh, become standard, and there is no discretion. So if there is a standard design that is applicable to all uses in a district, then those are permitted and there is no discretion. There's no review of the design. It is applied as a rule, similar to a lot of the other rules that are currently in the bylaw. Where there is discretion on design, there is a question about who reviews those applications. So that comes into question. Same um, on any development permit. Um, who's making the decision on, on what, how long does it take to review, those sorts of things. So there might be, as a result of the form, some changes to some of the process for the development permit review. And the development standards will be primarily the form. That's where a lot of the <coughs> form elements will come into play. And those actually exist within the land use districts. So they are development standards for the land uses in the districts, um, but they are considered development standards. So we believe that this approach um, addresses all of the MGA requirements. Uh, maximizes the opportunity that the MGA provides, uh, implements the direction from the Municipal Development Plan as an implementation tool, and achieves the project goals that were defined for this particular project. Um, in terms of the specific aspects of use-based and form-based zoning, this is how that particular approach would play out, um, what we're proposing. Uh, which ones would be form-based and which ones would be use-based. And overall, the high, this approach, we believe, would achieve the, the goal of being easy to use and understand uh, be very, by being very clear and concise, particularly on the elements that are most important to the municipality. Um, it would reduce the number of districts, clarify the uses and the design requirements in each, and each district would be specifically calibrated to Beaumont's context. Um, based on the information that we get back from the public and from stakeholders. 
So that's, that's the approach that we're proposing. And uh, if you have any questions, please let us know. We're here to answer anything that you might want to talk about. Fantastic presentation. Yeah. Certainly enjoyed reading the, the documents and, and how this is all starting to nicely come together. So thank you. Uh, I'd like to talk to uh, or ask Mr. Schwartz if there's anything further from the administration. Anything you want to add, Mr. Dur Durley? Nothing that I uh, At this time, I don't think there's anything further to add to Melissa's presentation. Um, the approach that we're proposing to move forward with is, as she presented, a mix between the conventional zoning and the plant-based zoning. Um, the R. Sotraville project will help inform some of that form-based um, information, and we have the design shred, second design shred um, happening tomorrow in an open house, tomorrow evening. Um, we have the land use bylaw uh, survey that is out and, and uh, circulated for a response as well, so that will help inform some of the regulations. Um, but it is essential um, that we determine the format so that we can then begin writing the regulations so that we know which direction we're going in. Um, so at this time, we're, we're wanting to find out support or questions or concerns with this format. Okay, thank you. See, questions from Council. Cap. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Hendricks. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, my, my question is around how this gets presented in the consultation. It's, it's technical, no doubt about it. I'm swimming a little bit myself and trying to understand what it really means when it's uh, put into practice. And I'm just looking at the stakeholder workshops that are planned, and it doesn't look like they're planned for the general public. It's more uh, focus groups with developers, people who, who understand what it is you're talking about. That concerns me a little bit because it, it's like we're approving something that really our citizens don't know what we're approving because it's not them that understands what we're changing. So I can, can you give me some comfort that what's going to be presented is, it, it's going to tell people how are things going to change, what's going to be different, what, what are we really changing? Sure. Um, so to, to um, start with some of the engagement, uh, one of the engagement pieces that we're doing is there will be an article in the in the newspaper this week that talks about the land use bylaw changes, how this is going to affect people, um, what those proposed changes are going to, um, not what the changes are going to be, but what the proposed changes will be changing or, or looking at, um, and how that does affect the, the, the regular uh, citizen. The focused um, workshops are, are with those, um, those people who are actually going to be doing the developing. So they tend to use, so those are people like commercial businesses, developers, um, our annexation landowners who um, will be looking to uh, eventually sell their land to developers, so how that land will become developed. And the larger portion of the population that uses <coughs> the land use bylaw are those, those types of developers. The day-to-day -day citizen does still have, um, is affected by the land use bylaw, um, but typically it's, it's more on the lines of when they're going to do something different to their property, like build a shed. Um, those aren't huge broad-based changes and, and shouldn't be changing um, a whole lot and, and being um, uh, affected in, in too significant of, of, a, of a manner. Um, so those, what we're hoping with this, this new format of the land use bylaws, it'll make it easier for that general citizen to be able to read and find out those regulations for them. As the process goes on, um, until we, what we find is until we start actually writing regulations, people don't understand it. So we can ask all of the questions that we can through the survey, we can provide awareness, um, we're out in the public talking about them, and we still are getting, well, how does this affect me? What does that mean? It doesn't, until we actually put something in writing, we won't know what their feedback is going to be. So that's really when we're going to get it, is once we start getting these regulations developed. Yeah. yeah, and I just want to add in too that in terms of the general public, there is a part of the engagement now happening that is quite a focus on um, the broad survey that is available to all public members. So as Joan said, they're going out to events to raise awareness that the survey is available. And so the survey does ask questions about, remember, keep in mind that Lange's file is a tool to enable what the community wants to develop. So we're focused more on what you want to develop 
and then we figure out how to build a tool to support that. So the survey is available to all, so there is lots of opportunity for broad-based. Um, and the other piece of the puzzle is in tandem with that article, uh, there's been a video developed that really is um, a, a much more simplified approach to what is zoning, what does it impact to you, and that the intention of that work is to reach out to members of the public and understand. That, that, I guess that's my point. I'd like to see some general understanding of what the land use bylaw is, so people understand what it is we're doing. Yeah. So, so those pieces are fear that, that you know changing something, but we really don't know what. And just wait until we change it, and then we'll tell you. And then that, that wouldn't be okay. So yes, yeah, so we do have those those informational pieces out there, and we're directing people through Let's Talk Beaumont. Um, to find out more information, so not just to do the survey, but to find out more Video information. Video now? It is. Okay. Yeah. And it's on the website? It's Let's Talk Beaumont. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Council? Your Worship. Uh, I got a couple comments and a couple questions. Um, yeah. In my other day job, living and working in this environment, I'm, I'm all for anything that's going to be more flexible and easier to use. So my concern sur is actually surrounding the implementation of this hybrid thing. Uh, <coughs> sorry, thing, hybrid land use bylaw. <laughs> it's been a day. Um, at, because we, we have an opportunity to really drive our process and streamline it, because I would hate to have come out at the other end of this and have a more cumbersome process than we have now. And so some of the things that we need to be looking at are the end product of how people apply for development permits, how they get approved, and how they get make steps like easier to process them has any been thought been given to that at this early stage it is definitely not our intent in any way to make things more challenging it's a point of simplifying the regulations if the process becomes harder um, that is not the intent at all partially by um, clarifying the regulations that in itself definitely makes the process easier to begin with because then with a broader a better broader understanding by all people that um, use it better applications can be made, better discussions and can, can be had, uh, even at the very early stages of an application. Um, that being said, it it is also not our intent to add uh, more review process to it. You know, there's some pretty um, strict timelines in the MGA where a development permit has to, has to meet, and it's always our intent to try to meet those as much as possible, which is also why as part of the clarifying process, we want to understand the difference between what is a standard design feature and what is an optional design feature. That's one of our, our key goals, is, is where there are standard design requirements that's standard for all applications and it becomes general understanding. Where there's optional and there, that equals discretion, that's where additional time is added to the process. And so that's where those have to be very deliberate in terms of what is considered standard and what is considered optional. Um, and that will, be a key element of the bylaw, partially as well because it has to inform where where the line is between a permitted or, and a discretionary use, which is a requirement of the MGA. So it is mandatory that we review that in a lot of details. Um, that being said, a significant part of the project is also training. Uh, so as we get closer to having a finalized bylaw that has been reviewed by the public, um, and we're getting closer to the public uh, the public hearing. We will be meeting with um, staff as well to help teach them about the bylaw, what they need to be looking for, and uh, how to implement it. And there is also a monitoring program that we will be developing as well to make sure that the implementation is smooth and easy. Uh, that being said, any new thing is a little bit challenging right at the beginning, so we want to try to reduce those, those bumps that might occur as much as possible, uh, and we'll be working very closely with staff to do that. Sure, please. Has there been any thought to giving training to the development community on your new land use bylaw? Like a couple of half day seminars to lay it out and train the process and get let them have a jump on it. <laughs> so one of our engagement um, focus engagement sessions is with the development community. Um, so we can definitely broach that as a subject and see if there's some uptake in that. Um, the, we have standard developers in Beaumont, so we know who our land developers are. It's the commercial developers who, who just kind of pop in and pop out. Um, so to try and target that uh, training might be a little bit more difficult. It's not that we can't reach out to them, but we can definitely um, see what the uptake is for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Dalek. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ladies. Uh, on page 32, I understand um, 
the idea of the hybrid approach, the conventional bylaw and the um, form-based bylaw, the illustration does show kind of a 50-50 a split between the two. Is that for illustration purposes, or do you envision the bylaw having the intent of being more form-based or more conventional-based, or is it fluid enough to, in some areas it could be more form-based, in other areas it can be more conventional. I'm not as fluid as some of my colleagues in terms of the bylaws, how these work, so is this more of illustration purposes, or is it the intent to be a balance of roughly 50-50 between conventional and form-based? It is, um, for illustration purposes, how it um, is likely to play out in different scenarios um, is that where there's commercial aspect or at grade retail, there will be more significant form-based components given the uh, importance of that particular type of use and its interaction with the street. Where you're in a more uh, like general residential area, um, there will be some form-based elements, but the intent there is actually uh, more so to be flexible in what can occur in order to support uh, not just the density targets that we're talking about, but also the sustainability uh, requirements that we look at with the municipality. The flexibility on the residential side is uh, really important, and so there will be a bit of a, a difference between the different types of districts that will occur. Thank you. Great, thank you. Yeah, just a couple of comments. Um, sort of building off what uh, what the mayor had mentioned. You, you asked for feedback in terms of the direction. Mm -hmm. The one, like I personally like the concept, um, but it's because you guys have taken the time to explain it, and you do a great job of doing that. The, the concern that I have is you had indicated, you know, you used the example of High River, um, but the concern I have is that we might be doing something too new and be too far ahead of the pack, uh, and the. It could a, cause some confusion, but it may um, lead us, and when we need to be attracting as much development as possible, it, it could um, potentially you know, turn us off from the um, development community. So I think the, the engagement that, that you guys have gone through is gonna be, is gonna be crucial there. I'm um, definitely not against it. I just, that, that is the concern for me, that um, if, it, if it's too new for them, they don't quite know, right? If you're looking to invest capital, you know, it's always gonna flow the easiest way. Uh, obviously there's more things behind it, but that, that's just an observation. Um, and similar to, to what uh, the mayor indicated about, um, you know, his question was more about engaging the development community during the process. My question is more after it. So we get it done, um, great. That this could be, if this is where we go, this could be a great way to market Beaumont as, you know, this is a new, um, a great way to promote us, right? So is there an opportunity? Have you seen, did High River do anything like this? Is something where we could get a package and, and, and give us an opportunity to mark, go out to the, particularly the commercial side, as you mentioned, we, we know our residential stuff, but can we use that to say, look, you know, this is, you know, it's an, it's an aggressive council that we've updated this bylaw to help it make it easier to, for development, because I think, um, you know, whether it's true or not, the perception is it's, it's kind of tough to do development, um, particularly on the commercial side in Beaumont. So is there a way that we could spin this into a really good positive? I've seen examples of that, just general thoughts on, on that. Well, one of the things that, that usually occurs with a form-based approach is, is the process actually becomes simplified because there's very, uh, clear requirements on the things that are really important. You know, so if you talk about certain design standards, instead of walking into a process, if you're a commercial developer, walking into a process and, and you make an application to the to Beaumont and you say, you know, I'd like to do this here, and you know that there's design guidelines, you know that there's a land use bylaw, you know that there's engineering, set, there's all these other things, and you go in, okay, this is my proposal, we need your review, we need your comments, we'll adjust the proposal, and we'll see where it lands. Under this type of a format, because a lot of those decisions in terms of form and design have been determined and they're clear and they're certain for people, you walk in and you know when you make your application likely what the comments are going to be from the municipality anyways. And so it actually simplifies the process in a lot of ways. The certainty for the developer, the commercial business owner, means that they can come to the municipality and know that the process and the won't be as onerous as other places. In a lot of ways, that's a competitive advantage um, that municipalities have, is that if you simplify the process, you have very clear requirements in the land use bylaw. Um, that time is money for developers, and if you can reduce the time of the process and streamline that, then that <coughs> seems favorable for the developers. So, I, I, would, I would agree, um, but again, the only reason why I understand that it is similar is because you've taken the time to go through and do it. I think. <laughs> I think we'd need to get out there and, and 
and I'm sure the development community are aware of this, it's not brand new to them, but uh, there's some sort of way that we can market and, and show them how much easier it is to come and develop in here. So maybe less a, a comment or question for you guys, maybe just for council yeah. and, and administration to think about uh, as we get down that road to try and somehow turn this into, a, um, not somehow, I think it's an easy, to turn this into a, a positive um, opportunity for um, Mr. Mackin and Code to be able to go out and say, look how much easier it is. This is this is you know where we're at type thing um, mm -hmm. just to expect people to to see it and like, oh that's going to be easier mm -hmm. without us kind of walking them through it so that was just a, a comment mm -hmm. more than anything for us to consider okay i got it okay. thank you mr chairman so just uh, to fill that out a little bit more at some point the consultant's role will end yeah and then the municipality needs to take on the role of implementation so there's quite a few options uh when i was fortunate just to be at the american planning association conference I happened to happened upon a form-based code session which talked about different cities that have been implementing this. One of the great cities to go for sources and examples for implementation is Denver. They have the forms, that's something that we can look at and realize it's a larger city, but it's not hard to take those kind of things and then translate it to something uh, Beaumont's side. So the other cities that, um, that are looking at this or have already implemented this um, in the States, it's not brand new, so Las Vegas, Miami, um, Raleigh, North Carolina. So there's a lot of different examples that we can take from. Um, and it's also no problem for us to pick up the phone and call the planners down there and ask them for their implementation tips, you know, what we should do, what we shouldn't do, and then be able to unroll that. So that's something that as this progress or process progresses, um, we will work on looking at what that implementation is and uh, what that rollout's going to be. Okay, thank you. A uh, couple questions, a couple comments. Uh, first one on the land use bylaw survey on that stop and why not stop. When's that survey open until? It's open currently until May 21st, but we're looking at extending it. What has the uptake on that been to date? Um, the last update I got was yesterday morning, and we had 36 actual responses, but we had over 200. Um, we had over 297 people visit the site. Yeah. Well, you have 37 responses now. I went oh, through it today. Thank you. Um, so one of the one of the things I would say on that, uh, and it's it's late for feedback on the survey. It's very involved, and I had to sit down for about half an hour to wrap my head around it, and it was a tough survey. Uh, so just some feedback on that. It literally took me about half an hour to wrap my head around it. Um, second question, uh, does form-based zoning leave approvals at a judgment call for administration and planning versus approved, not approved? I seen there was a comment in there um, around uh, implementation and you need to learn the implementation. Uh, it, at the end of the day, will a applicant get an approved, not approved, or will there be a judgment call involved in that approval based on guidelines? It felt like it was a little bit wishy-washy in the way it was presented. There will definitely be an approval, not approval. That element of the process will not change. Um, that's why we need to be very clear and deliberate on what is a standard design feature, or what's that standard design or form that is that is required, and when that has is optional or discretionary, because that will inform the permitted or discretionary uses. And very similar to the process today, where you have a permitted use, there is no discretion on the municipalities um, or behalf on any application and where there is a discretionary use there is some discretion today and that will continue to exist uh, it's just what the discretion is on good yeah cool um, question on uh, the overall project I would say um, when we look at the timeline at the beginning uh, you know what we want to see is Beaumont's open for business uh, how are we going to look back and define success on this project um, you talked about the uh, a monitoring and reporting section and uh, McElhaney being involved in that but when the project is done and when we're through the timeline and we're into that process and we look back and say you know a we've you know the project is rewrite the land use bylaw check Re rewrite the land use bylaw to achieve a b c d and e what, what are some of those measures of success what do they look like uh, one of them is about um, satisfaction with the overall bylaw um, we're not looking for support generally. It's a type of project that is difficult to appeal to um, that level that would dictate support from the general public or from stakeholders and business owners, but satisfaction. 
is what we're we're going for. Um, that's one of our key measures. Is are you satisfied with the bylaw that we're proposing? As in the municipality satisfied, developer satisfied. The various groups. Um, you know, we're we're going out to to several different stakeholder groups in the public, and I think we would look for satisfaction from all of them as much as possible. Okay. Um, one, one more here. Uh, so how would that lead us to know that business and developer concerns have been brought forward? I know we're doing a lot of engagement. Uh, you know, how, how will we know as a council when this is all done that the concerns that were brought forward are have either been considered, mitigated, or incorporated into the final product? Uh, you know, are, are, are we going to have some kind of a concordance table or something? Because um, this council heard a lot during the election around issues from this and issues for that, and we actually heard the most from residents. Um, and then, as Kathy pointed out, you know, if the residents don't know what's going on and can't go, then then you know that group goes to this big with with business owners. I know the the uptake is probably pretty high with some of the shreds you guys have had. I have looked in on the Saunterville stuff, and I think that's good that there's an incorporation there, but. Um, I guess where I'm going with that is, at the end of the day, when the land use bylaw is rewritten, how do we know that we've checked off the, the concerns mm -hmm. for residents and businesses and developers? Uh, so there's two reports that you will likely see as the project moves forward. One is um, when all the engagement events are done, there will be a summary of the feedback that we have received from all of the different groups and all the, the survey. All of that information will be public and available okay. as to what we've heard. When the draft of the bylaw is released as well, um, we will also have a supplementary report that talks about the, how the feedback was incorporated and the rationale for that, how that aligns with the project goals, uh, the municipal development plan, and the MGA requirements. Um, so that will also be made available to public council, uh, everybody for so review. Be a piece when of they paper that says here's the issues and here's what we did. Yeah, so and, and so that people aren't just be... interpreting the bylaw on their own, right? There will be that information about what what was changed and why, and how that feedback was incorporated. I think that's important. Yes, or why it wasn't. Or, or why it didn't work. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I and, think that's important on the back end. And just to add to that, though, I mean, just because we're checking off boxes now, the land use bylaw is a living document, right? So it's always changing. It's always, um, you know, having revisions done to it. And so oh, for sure. that's part of that monitoring as well. Make sure we're monitoring trends and different <coughs> that need to be updated in that. So it's just because it's rewritten it doesn't mean it's finished. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councilor Sam, before we go to the next item, did you want to? Uh, <clears throat> something with respect to modification of the agenda. Yeah, uh, uh, please, and thank you. Um, just add, a, add an agenda item, I guess, 3H, um, just around the business summit. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Downer. Councilor, uh, Chairman, I'd like to add an uh, item as well to a discussion on the uh, sound system at the community center, please. Just a brief, a quick, a very brief conversation. Thank you. If we may. Please. Um, Thursday, there's a special committee of the whole meeting on economic development. Um, it was the intent of the administration that we would also address the business summit on Thursday this week. Um, I don't know if that helps or not. Does that answer the question? It does. Okay, thank you. And the sound system, as I understood, was uh, out for tender. Or at least perhaps the administration with Mr. Schwartz. Do we need to add it? Yeah, perhaps, we need to add it? perhaps not. Okay, then we'll move forward to it. It would be a information item at 5A. Yeah. Come on, our questions to admin at 5. I'm sorry, that would be a quick question to admin under item 5 on the agenda. Information item? Sure. Okay, then we'll give it that. Okay, then we'll Thank move you. forward. Uh, let's go to 3C, action on uh, smoking and health. Uh, Mr. Les Hagen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, Good welcome. Evening. Thank you. Uh, action on smoking and health is Western Canada's leading tobacco control organization. We've been based in Edmonton for about 40 years. So I haven't been around that long, but uh, the organization has been quite active. 
and uh, in, including uh, Beaumont, and Beaumont historically has had one of the most progressive smoking bylaws in the province. In fact, uh, I believe back in 2004, it might have been the very first municipality to ban smoking in restaurants and bars here in, in Alberta, which led ultimately to the development of provincial legislation. So we appreciate that leadership and we look forward to more going forward. Um, I'm going to talk about cannabis legalization here, an issue that thousands of municipalities are grappling with right now across Canada. And our concerns involve the possible renormalization of smoking, the joint use or combined use of tobacco and cannabis, and about one third of all joints are rolled with tobacco. The regulatory inconsistencies that exist and may exist following legalization, and then opportunities for tobacco reduction. Uh, now, uh, Alberta municipalities have been taking two different approaches, almost two diametrically opposed approaches to cannabis legalization. And one is more of a drug control approach, uh, which uh, focusing almost exclusively on cannabis and regulating the public consumption of cannabis. The other is a more public health approach that involves the regulation of cannabis, but not necessarily the complete prohibition of cannabis use but spreading out those restrictions to include other substances that are smoked and baked. So that's the approach that we recommend. And the latter approach also does not require any kind of medical user exemption, because if, if you're banning it completely or trying to, the first thing your lawyers will tell you is that you need a, a, an exemption for medical users, which has the potential to undermine the entire ban, because it, it comes down to who's going to be able to get a doctor's note. Uh, but without getting too much into the weeds here, I just want to talk a little bit more about the overall <laughs> the issue. Weeds. <laughs> the weeds. Pun intended. And uh, this is really what we're talking about here, uh, is the uh, modeling of smoking to young people. And kids are very impressionable and uh, modeling is an essential component of childhood development. Every parent knows that. If you're modeling healthy behaviors, you get a he you're more likely to get a healthy kid. If you're modeling unhealthy behaviors, you're more likely to get an unhealthy kid. So uh, this is a, a large part of our focus and our orientation on this issue. Uh, regarding the politics here, I like, I like addressing this up front. Everybody knows it, but it needs to be stated once in a while. It's not public health or health that is driving this agenda, it's politics and commercialization. And uh, we know that cannabis legalization is on a four-year election track uh, for uh, you know, trying to get this done before the next election. Votes have been won and lost over this issue. We all know who won. And uh, that definitely has a bearing on, on the timelines that have been set around cannabis legalization. So yeah, we're expecting a bit of a delay with implementation, and, and the bill is still in front of the Senate, but we're not expecting a long delay. This will be done well before the next election, and, and likely before the end of this summer. So despite what we've heard from federal and provincial governments and their health ministers, public health really is taking a back seat to commercialization and politics. So we're asking municipalities to pick up some of the slack. And uh, there's almost been a reefer madness approach to legalization. That's how it's been described by, by one drug policy expert nationally, it is because it is on a political track that public health and uh, health concerns in general are really not uh, at, at, at uh, taking a, a large priority in the decision making. So I want to talk about tobacco here too, because we can address uh, a few legal substances here. And tobacco has an enormous impact on our quality of life. It is the only substance that kills half of its users when used exactly as intended by its manufacturers. And in Canada, that means 45,000 premature deaths a year, or one in every two long-term smokers. So it has an enormous impact. And of course, non-smokers are also affected. Also some unique properties, there's no safe level of consumption. Nicotine is highly addictive. Uh, think of this, 
about two-thirds of tobacco users are addicted to nicotine, while only about 10% of cannabis users are actually clinically dependent on cannabis. So it shows, it demonstrates the, the difference in the addictiveness of these substances. And then youth, of course, is a special challenge, and we still have 25,000 youth tobacco users in Alberta, school-aged children, and that's 25,000 too many. So you know, while we're making gains and while the smoking rates are, are the lowest ever, uh, there still is a lot of room to move, and municipalities can play an important role, can and have uh, played an important role. And here in Alberta, we've got special challenges, like the most affordable cigarettes in Canada, uh, and uh, some of the worst retail compliance rates in, in the country. So there's, there's lots of room uh, to, to, to move and to pick up some slack here. And our bottom line with respect to cannabis legalization is that tobacco really can't be overlooked in any legitimate discussion about legal drugs. And we're going to give you an, some, propose some opportunities to do that. Uh, so what can municipalities do? Uh, well, restrict the public use of cannabis and tobacco. License the sale of cannabis and tobacco. Everyone's talking about cannabis licensing to cannabis sales. Why don't you license tobacco sales? About half a dozen Alberta municipalities already have, uh, including uh, Edmonton and Calgary. So there's another revenue source. You can place zoning restrictions on the sale of both products. You don't just have to focus on cannabis. And you can, uh, you know, particularly on new tobacco retailers. And then you can close a number of loopholes that exist in provincial legislation. And I'll show you those loopholes in, in a minute. Well, here's some, I've uh, got, got a nice chart here, too. Uh, so, uh, provincially, vaping of anything is allowed anywhere. There will be some restrictions on cannabis vaping coming forward, but nothing provincially on tobacco or nicotine vaping. And shisha and hookah smoking is permitted provincially. Uh, some municipalities have dealt with it, some haven't. Uh, for the most part, smoking and vaping is, is permitted at parks and public events provincially. Uh, and uh, of course, in hotels and group living facilities. And then there's really no guidance or direction from the provincial government with respect to cannabis or tobacco smoking in multi-unit housing. And that issue is on fire right now. Uh, whether people who are living in apartment buildings or condos who are concerned now about uh, cannabis and what their neighbors might be doing and what they might have to breathe. A lot of them are already breathing tobacco smoke. Now here's a chart of all the uh, provincial restrictions on cannabis and tobacco. Not all, but selected. Uh, in indoor settings and outdoor settings, and uh, if you can make sense out of this chart, let me know. Because it really doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, you've got e-cigarettes with nicotine that are completely exempted, but not cannabis, but, but not e-cigarettes with cannabis. And you've got shisha smoking that's completely exempted, but not cannabis smoking uh, in indoor places. So we need some consistency, and these are all holes that municipalities can fill. Uh, so, uh, we do have a model bylaw, and uh, we will provide that to you. I think it's already been provided, we'll, we'll make sure everyone has it. And in that model bylaw, we have a broad definition of smoking that captures cannabis smoking, hookah, shisha, e-cigarettes, any substance that can be smoked or vaped. So it also prepares you for anything that's coming forward in the future. Uh, and then our, the outdoor restrictions in this bylaw include parks, public events, playgrounds, sports fields, basically all outdoor recreation areas that are accessible to kids. That's our focus, is because we're worried about modeling to kids. And you know, to a five-year-old, it really doesn't matter whether you're uh, uh, vaping cannabis or tobacco or smoking tobacco or cannabis or smoking a cigar. To a five-year-old, it's all smoking. So this modeling carries on. And, and e-cigarettes, as you know, just kick out an enormous amount of emissions. Uh, they might not be that harmful to breathe, but they certainly are harmful when it comes to modeling smoking behavior to kids. So we have to think about that. And uh, then, of course, in our bylaw, there's no allowance for smoking rooms because there is no such thing as an effective smoking room unless you're putting in uh, basically a wind tunnel. Uh, and uh, then 
the bylaw we propose can be enforced by bylaw officers and or peace officers. So we've got uh, legalization quickly approaching and uh, hoping that municipalities will prepare. Just three final points here in terms of recommendations. Uh, we propose a broad public ban on all forms of smoking and vaping rather than a complete ban on the public use of cannabis alone. We believe that uh, the municipalities should establish, could establish discrete smoking areas and selected outdoor places if necessary. These areas should be at least 50 meters away from any high traffic area or any crowd. Um, and they should be well marked and they shouldn't be directly visible to kids. And then we also, you know, regarding this issue of drug control versus behavior control, municipalities aren't historically in the business of drug control. That's left up to federal and provincial governments. What municipalities historically do is behavior control, whether it's nuisances or smoking bylaws or shoveling walks, you know, getting the public to, uh, uh, and community standards, right? So the, the bylaw that we are proposing is much more aligned with community standards than taking a, a more focused drug control approach. And at the end of the day, it's gonna have a much broader public health impact. Thank you. Great. Well, fantastic presentation. Um, question to Mr. Schwartzen and further. Well, just to clarify that we are in the process of uh, developing our rules and, and regulations when we get back to our council, and this is great information. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Can I go to council then? Mayor, any questions, I, comments? I, yeah, no, other than it's, thank you very much. It's sort of timely, as, as you said. Uh, the, CAO, the CAO and his staff are working hard, so. I'm sure they'll incorporate it as we go. Thank you very much. Uh, will the recommendations that you put forward, will they be provided to administration? I don't see them in our package here. I'll, I'll make sure they are. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Seeing nothing further. Oh, sorry. Nope. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for the presentation. You mentioned that Alberta has the worst retail compliance of any province. Correct. Um, how are we deficient compared to other, other provinces using that definition? What are we not doing other provinces are doing? We're just not implementing and enforcing good legislation. We ha actually have good provincial legislation to deal with youth access. And one of the few provinces that have actually mandate carding anyone under the age of 25. And the only jurisdiction in North America that, re that requires mandatory training for tobacco retailers. That doesn't exist. So we just have to implement the legislation that was passed four years ago and, uh, and apply some enforcement people to it. We have more rat inspectors in Alberta than tobacco inspectors. Thank you. Just a really quick one. You touched on licensing tobacco. Uh, you said the city of Edmonton does it. We don't. I'm not familiar. Can you just provide a explanation? I, I missed the first part of that. Sorry, licensing. You said yeah, there's an opportunity. Oh, licensing. Yes, yeah. of course. Yeah. The difference. Yeah, and St. Albert uh, licenses as well. So it's just a matter of creating a special category under your, under your existing business license bylaw for tobacco vendor. And then you can apply a separate fee. Uh, and you can apply special conditions to that too, like compliance with existing federal and provincial laws. So St. Albert is charging, I believe, $800 per licensee. <coughs> Edmonton's charging about $500. Lloyd, Min Lloyd Minster is charging about $1,200 per license. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Appreciate it. Thanks. Cheers. Okay. Next item up is the Beaumont Society of the Arts, town of Beaumont Falsey, Chantel Garley, and Grant Tolley. Welcome. Hi. So I will, um, I'll give a, I'll, I'll start the presentation. I'll turn it over to, uh, to Chantel and uh, Grant. So thank you, um, Chairperson, Your Worship, members of Council. Um, before you, we have uh, the draft version of the Beaumont Society of the Arts, Town of Beaumont Arts and Culture Policy. We've been working on back and forth for probably about the last, uh, I'm going to say year, uh, in terms of uh, the policy development. Um, uh, Mr. Hiltz, I've just been told of a technical problem. Okay. We just lost our feet. Does somebody need five minutes to do that okay. repair? Might not even take five minutes. And if that's the case, then we'll take five. My apologies to get reset. And, uh, Take a health break.